I was talking to Kathy, our dear friend Kathy Wilkinson, over at the House of Hope. Those girls haven't gotten to come back and rejoin us today. Girls, we love y'all. Ladies, we love you. Sister, we love you. They've got some older ladies over there, and Sister Helen's doing the right thing just to protect them in there and make sure everybody's doing the right thing. And so we just support them, but we miss them, don't we? And they miss being here in Jesus' name. Ladies, we love y'all. Just want you to know that special. She gave me a word yesterday, and she said, you know what, the Lord, and she was just weeping. It was her birthday. Let's sing happy birthday to her. Happy birthday to Kathy. Happy birthday to Kathy. Happy birthday to Kathy. Happy birthday to you. When you, sh when you show up, we'll sing it real slow. Happy. But you got to show up. But she gave me a word, Scott, and this is a word for all of us. And, and it's a word that I, 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 I have missed this, just straight up, y'all. Miss this sometimes. And it's compassion. And I, I, I've missed it. I have just in, in fighting for, for us. I just have not been compassionate like I should have been, like I want to be. I guess I've been a little bit like Elijah after he did the fight with the Baals. And, and, and he won that, that, that battle. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit here in a second. But he got to feeling sorry for himself. And he had warred so much. And then he just went up underneath that broom tree. I, I'm going to read it right now. Let's, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. And I'm going to read quite a bit right here. I'd like you to take this journey with me. Would you do it? It's a journey of, of great hope. The name of this message today is Courageous Love. We've all identified the problem. As a matter of fact, I don't really even want to have to go back into it and reiterate it and all of that kind of stuff. The collateral damage of it all and all those things, I'm not even going to visit about it. I'm not going to give it any glory at all, okay? But now, what's the antidote for it? What's the antidote for all fear? Well, it's the perfect love, isn't it? It is the perfect, courageous love of Jesus. The perfect, courageous love of Jesus manifested through us that cast out, that crushes, that demolishes, that annihilates all the fear. If the fear is the root and then we see all the repercussions and the collateral damages uh, that, that is going on, we go back to the root, don't we? And we say, okay, I see where this root is. And this root can't have me. And we're going we're gonna to take it out right now in Jesus' name. I'm so proud of the guys that are at Redemption Ranch. For those of y'all that don't know, hallelujah. Redemption Ranch is a newly forming discipleship home over in Gilmer, and uh, these guys are serious about Jesus, and God is working out some things. I'm just so proud of them. We had about 20 guys last, uh, last Thursday night going deep through this journey. If you're a man and you want to be here next Thursday night at 530, I invite you to be join the team. It'll be a perfect time to join. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 18 is what I'm going to read, but I want to just have a little bit of a precursor here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, and you know this scripture. It says, people will be lovers of themselves, and I'm paraphrasing. They'll be selfish and immoral, unforgiving and rash, and lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness while denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. So these are people that are, that, that, that have been, that are double-minded. They have a form of godliness. There's some measure of godliness in them, but they have no power in it. It's like it's religion, but I don't, I don't, I don't operate from the, from the Holy Spirit, from the empowerment of the presence of God. Do you see the difference? Maybe, I, maybe you're like me. I've been there. I've been a, a guy that knew all the answers I knew about God and all of those kind of things, but I had no power within me to operate. And I didn't want it, and I didn't know how. Well, I want to hand you the power today in Jesus' name. I don't want to hand it to you. I, I pray that you get it right from the Holy Ghost and right in Jesus' name. And if we operate, I've, I've seen what's going on in, in people right here. And as I've examined it and prayed about it, the people that are operating in religion, they have, they're living powerless lives. But the people that are operating in the Spirit... They are overcoming these things. They're not allowing these things to penetrate them. They're seeing through it. They're seeing in the spirit. They're recognizing the revelation of the anti-Jesus spirits and everywhere that they're coming from. And they're not letting it have power over them. So if we can begin to say, where in myself am I allowing any fiery dart to penetrate me? And where am I going to put my shield of faith? And it's going to say, courageous love right there. Boom. 
and it's going to knock all of those things down in Jesus' name. Any dart that's starting to come and penetrate your home and your heart in Jesus' name, let the courageous love crush it right now in Jesus' name. Let it be blocked down and knocked down right now in Jesus' name. Because you know what? You've got the power. We've got the power, and it's time to operate in it in Jesus' name. All right, let's go over here to... Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 18, because you're going to see in this message today called Courageous Love, you're going to see two really clear times that people operate in the courageous love, in the power, in the Holy Spirit, and times that they go to the flesh. So if we can get this revelation of it, and we can make a determination today to separate ourselves from everything of the Spirit, uh, separate ourselves from everything of the flesh, and immerse ourselves completely in the Spirit with a repentant heart, in great humility, then you know what? This is going to be victory, 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 power, power, power in our lives. And you're going to be able to translate that and transfer it to the next guy in Jesus' name. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 18. Now this is right after Elijah had whipped up on the Asherahs and the Asherahs and the Baal prophets. These are like the social media gurus of our day. These are like the, the scientific people that, that, that are like, uh, there is no God. The atheists and these kind of people, all right? This is the, the, the tech giants that are all about uh, information, everything from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, everything that has to do with that tree. That, these are these people. And Elijah killed them all. Well, behind, Ahab was the king, but behind the king was Jezebel. Jezebel was really running the show over there in Israel at this time, okay? And Elijah had no problem confronting Ahab. Boom, Ahab, you don't scare me. But as soon as Jezebel came out, okay, he began to run. He got scared of her. This is the first thing we're going to look at. And then last week we began to see how the Jezebel spirit is behind everything that's going on in America right now. The Jezebel spirit is the one that's all about intimidation and fear. And if you're receiving it, if any of your family or anybody is receiving that, let's, don't, let's gently and courageously just say, come on, y'all. Let's begin to operate in the Spirit to overcome these things in Jesus' name and to not receive them. And I want to just compassionately uh, agree. You know what? I, I wrote this word called partners at the top of my, my thing here because I, I consider us partners, y'all. Like, 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 like in the foxhole together and rising up here to courageously love people together in Jesus' name. And I want to stand there with you and help you when you need help. And I, will, I need some help a lot, y'all. And I need y'all to help me get out of that foxhole sometimes and run into that battle in Jesus' name. So we can do it together. So it's a partnership. I'm, not, I'm no different, man. I'm going through this thing with you in Jesus' name. I just want to be as transparent and as vulnerable and as courageously loving for real as I can possibly be, y'all. Okay? So in verse uh, 1 of chapter 19, it says, Now Ahab told Jezebel... And, you know, he, he like, tiptoed into the bedroom like this. Uh, Jezebel, um, Elijah killed all your prophets. Uh, he told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets of Baal with a sword. Then Jezebel, boy, she got riled up right now. Then Jezebel noticed that she didn't know that that had happened. That shows you how that she ain't supernatural, by the way, okay? He had to go tell her. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the God, small g, do to me, and even more, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like the life of one of them. In other words, he, she is, she's just throwing out these words of intimidation in an attempt to make him fearful. And Elijah was afraid. And he arose and he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself traveled farther into the wilderness, and he sat down under a juniper tree. Sometimes they call those broom trees. You know why they call those broom trees? This is completely nothing to do with the message. But uh, you know why they call a juniper tree a broom tree? Well, cut off a limb and don't see if it don't make a broom for you. You don't, you don't, you don't need a broom. You got a juniper tree. You just sweep out your house with the juniper tree. He himself traveled a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a broom tree, a juniper tree, and he asked God that he might die. Oh, man, he was by himself, wasn't he? Yeah. He was alone. This is a huge part of the equation. How many of you have gotten depressed when you are alone? 
I had, could be right there. For years, I stayed in that place right there of aloneness, not, uh, not willing to share my real pain with anybody unless I was just drunk and it was a meaningless time. Right now, in Jesus' name, we ask for a supernatural visitation of the Holy Ghost, that there would be no aloneness, that we would come together, that we would understand your spirit, and that you would take us over courageously, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we wouldn't put ourselves in this isolated place like Elijah did. See, instead of running into the wilderness, he could have gone and got his buddies. He could have gone and got some other people, some other Israelite people that were faithful. But he ran, and he said he wanted to die. It's enough now, Lord. I've done enough. Take my life. I'm no better than my father's. And he laid down, and he slept under the juniper tree. And behold, an angel touched him. Lord God, this is my prayer today, that the angel will touch us. Lord, we need the angel to touch us. We don't need just me to talk, Lord. Forgive me for talking too much. Let you speak, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the angel said, come on, get up and eat. He didn't say get up and go back into war. He didn't go get up and go chop Jezebel's head off. He said get up and eat. And Lord God, this is a time of eating. This is a time when the church is getting re-nourished right now in Jesus' name. Coming back together in love. Coming out of this place of isolation in the wilderness and coming together. And there you are graciously, compassionately, loving us, courageously loving us and just saying, Hey man, it's okay. I just want you to come and eat. Look, I prepared this for you. I've got this, this, this meal for you in Jesus' name. Get up and eat. And he, and he looked and by his head there was a bread cake baked on a hot coal and a pitcher of water. Well, we see the bread of life, and then we see the water of the Holy Ghost. Do you see that happening right now? Here's the Word of God, the bread of life, Jesus himself sitting on the, on the hot coals, and then there's the pitcher, the cold, cleansing, refreshing of the Holy Spirit. Would you like to receive that today in Jesus' name? You see, if we're going to go on a journey together, we've got to go on a journey together. Lord God, we begin to eat from your table. We begin to sup with you in Jesus' name. We rest our head like John the Beloved on the chest of Jesus himself and say, oh, could we sup with you? We want your word inside of us. We want to take you into us in Jesus' name. And Lord God, we need the refreshing of the Holy Ghost. Instead of all of the drama of the life of Jezebel trying to penetrate us at this time, we receive from you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill us. Fill us to overflowing now in Jesus' name. As we open up our spirit, man, to receive from you, may you just from heaven, from the throne room, from the river that goes right under the throne of Almighty God, from Jesus himself, from through the roots of the, of the trees of life, Lord God, from that throne room, would you refresh us with the Holy Spirit today, this morning, in Jesus' name. And we would receive it and we would drink deeply. Then the angel of the Lord came again a second time and he touched him. After he lay down to sleep, he said, get up and eat for your journey is long. So he got up and he ate and he drank with the strength of that food. He traveled for 40 days and 40 nights into Horeb. Lord God, yes, we've got some traveling to do. And Lord God, as he was traveling, he was intentionally focused on Almighty God. The presence of the Lord in the time of fasting is so intense, and I pray for the intensity of the presence of the Lord God upon us right now in Jesus' name. And here he came to a cave, and he spent the night in it, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very zealous and impassioned for the Lord God, and rightfully and uniquely his. Look, guys, this is so special to our calling at All Mission Ministries. We have been very zealous and very impassioned for the Lord. We have proclaimed his uniqueness, and God has put us together as an army of compassion to live in a very unique way and to, and to serve and to love in a very unique way. And I'm so grateful for each one of you soldiers in Jesus' name in this army of compassion. For his sons, the sons of Israel, this would be the church, have abandoned and broken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword and only I am left and they seek to take my life. So he said, the angel said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by and a great and powerful wind was tearing out the mountains and breaking the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. It began to shake the earth, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. 
And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was a, a sound, a gentle blowing, a whisper. And Elijah heard the sound, and he wrapped his face in his mantle, in his cloak. And I begin to think about this as I meditated on it, how many times we've, we've had to wrap our faces in those masks. And as we do, I pray that we hear the whisper of the Lord God and that it would become a mantle of covering everything that we do under his blood in Jesus' name. And it would make our ears attuned to his voice and our eyes focused upon him in whatever journey through whatever wilderness that we will take as opposed to focused on the flesh in the world. As opposed, to, as opposed to focusing in any kind of judgmental way against anyone, please, I repent of any of that in Jesus' name. And that we come in great grace together in Jesus' name. And when Elijah heard the whisper, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, a voice said, what are you doing here? And Elijah said, I've been very uh, zealous, and, I've, uh, 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 and many have abandoned me, and I'm paraphrasing, and we get down to verse 17, and it shall come. Uh, that there was anointing upon different kings in verse 18. Yet I will leave 7,000 survivors in Israel and all the knees that haven't bowed down to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. 7,000 compared to the number of Israelite people at this time was a very, very, very small minority. And this begins to tell you about the remnant of people that are really after the Lord Jesus and seeking after the Lord God, and refusing in every part of our life to bow our knee to any bail in our life, to any bail that we receive in Jesus' name. And I believe there's a great sanctification going on right here among you in Jesus' name, that there's a, an awareness where you see the Asherahs, and you see the bales and you hear the Jezebel, and you say, no, no, no. I don't want any of that. I'm not going to receive any of that. I'm going to receive this whisper of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to put myself in a place to hear him and to believe him in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you about Peter now. Revelation 12, 11 says this, and many of you are coming into this place. And we know the first part of it, but see, the second part of it, I believe, is, is even the more powerful part. It says we overcome and this was the fight that, that John was seeing in, in the book of Revelation. He's seeing the saints fighting against the great dragon, which was Lucifer himself. And Jesus is there telling him what he's, what he's seeing. And then John is getting this vision as Jesus is narrating this. And he's telling him. And he's, it's more than telling him. He's seeing the real fight going on. And as he's seeing this, he's, he's writing it down. And he says, they overcame them in this fight. By the blood of Jesus himself, by the sanctified, crucified blood of Jesus, and by their testimony, by what they said, as Glenn and Frank and Terry testified today, as Butch testified today, as Gary, Don, and Preston prayed, and we had a testimony in music, and you've testimony, testified to your friends in Jesus' name. We overcome them by the word of our testimony, the blood of the Lamb, and here's the thing that we don't get most of the time. And they did not love their life unto death. Now, this is the hard part, y'all, especially in a culture where we, we have kind of a, a Christianity that, that it does not demand very much from us. It doesn't make us into martyrs. I've heard Gary Don talk about becoming a martyr, and Jeremy talk about becoming a martyr, and being willing to die at any cost for the gospel in Jesus' name. That's what this is about, and this is how, how we overcome. I've seen Preston fighting down there in SEG with those guys, and he don't care if he gets shanked down there because he's not loving his life unto death in Jesus' name. And that's where we are, and that's what God is demanding of us. And you know what? There's a remnant, a remnant, a remnant, fewer and fewer that are ready to do it. But you're in there, man. You're in there getting it done in Jesus' name and loving this way. I want us to go and look at Peter's life. How many of you would recognize in your life that your life has looked like Judge Roy Scream over at Six Flags? <laughs> the Titan. The Mini Mine Train. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's that thing? Oh, that makes my stomach get crazy. Yeah, ground in a circle. I like that. Oh, man, we used to have this ride at the, at the Greg County Fair. This dude was rough, man. It was called the Zipper, okay? 
That, that thing, first of all, I had to loan them some baling wire to put it together in the first place before I got over there. But that would, it would flip you all the way over, and then each car would go like this as the whole thing was flipping over. That was, that was a rough deal right there. How many of you in life has looked like the zipper, okay? <laughs> Mine too. All right. So now, before I chunk a rock at you and you chunk a rock at me, let's look at another dude in the Bible. And we're, gonna, we're gonna, just going to fly through this right here. But then at the end of it, God is going to take us out. He's going to get us off the ride. How about that? Would you like to get off the zipper? Finally, Barmack, finally my brain kicked in. And the one time I went to the Gregg County Fair and I said, I ain't getting on it no more. Okay. I've left enough of my vomit on that dadgum zipper over there. I ain't going to do it again. Oh, you a chicken, Al? Yep. Count me in. That's right. Okay. No, I ain't a chicken. I just got, finally, I got a little wisdom in me. All right. So we're going to talk about Peter, and I'm just going to run right through this thing. And we're not chunking a rock at Peter either, but we're thanking God for his journey so that as we see his journey, his roller coaster journey, we won't, we're not going to pick it apart. We're going to see the whole thing right now. We're, we're going to say, you know what? Okay, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to see my life, the emotional journey and the pain I've gone through, and I'm receiving. You remember us talking about our wicks last week? If we keep our wicks in the Holy Spirit, this is the end of the roller coaster, okay? But if we keep our wicks in the drama of our lives and other people around us and, and receiving all of that stuff, we're going to be on the zipper the rest of our life, okay? But I'm praying we can get off today, every one of us in Jesus' name. So let's look at Peter. And I'm going to, uh, if, you're, if you're taking notes, I've just made some scripture references, but I'm just going to tell the story. I'm going to read a couple of these scriptures, but most of them, I'm just going to tell the story as we go. So we see Peter. Peter was one of the very first disciples that Jesus chose. He picked him out, uh, and they teamed up, and he said, okay, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. How about you guys? You want to be a fisher of men? Want to be a fisher of women? Want to be a fisher of kiddos, fisher of youth in Jesus' name? You are. You are a fisher of men in Jesus' name. One of the first things that we see is Jesus, when he began to heal, one of the very first people that he healed out of Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 through 17, was Peter's mother-in-law. He went to her house, and he healed her. Okay, so guess what? Peter's pretty happy, right? All right. Then he gets this great commissioning out of Matthew chapter 10, verse 1 through 8. And this is where God calls, Jesus calls all the apostles together, and he gives them that great command. I want you to go and declare that the kingdom of God is at hand. And when you go, don't take any money with you. Don't try to impress people. Don't go to a bunch of lost people. I want you to go to talk to the Israelite people. I want you to teach the Israelite people about me. He gave them a very specific direction. He said to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. Freely you have, freely you can give it away. And that was the commissioning that he gave Peter right there. Okay, so here's Peter. He's called by Jesus. Be a fisher of men. Here he is. His mother-in-law gets healed. Here he is. God says, okay, Jesus says, okay, I trust you. Here's what you're going to do okay and you can do this then they go they lay hands on these guys people get 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 healed they cast out the demons they come back they're having a big celebration around the bonfire and they say man we saw satan fall and jesus said don't be impressed about that boys just be thankful that your name is written in the lamb's book of life so now all of a sudden peter's starting to get a little wisdom in him isn't he well we pray that he would and then <clears throat> And then in Matthew 14, he, he's so fired up, he decides to get out of the boat at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> there he comes, Jesus. Jesus is at you. Jesus had been resting, okay? Then they, saw the, the, they all thought it was a ghost and everything. Peter was the first one to get out of there. And then, you know what? Peter, man, awesome. Big deal if he looked away for just a second. Which one of us have not looked away for a second? When he looked away for a second, he lost his power, okay? Great lesson for us. But he looked back, and Jesus brought him into that boat, right? He's still coming up this hill. And then Matthew 16, such a critical place in Scripture. We're going to begin in verse 13. I'm going to read this to you. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> now, when Jesus went to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answer, some say John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But Jesus said, uh, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter stepped up and spoke first, and he replied, you are Christ, the Messiah, the anointed Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed, happy, spiritually secure, favored by God are you, Simon, 
son of Jonah, because flesh and blood, mortal man, didn't tell you this or reveal it to you. But my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you in Jesus' name. So now Peter begins to get revelation. He begins to get revelation from God Almighty. And I say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I'll build my church. Now, some denominational people believe that from this scripture, Peter became the first pope and that the Catholic Church was built upon Peter himself. But I would say, in my humble opinion, that the rock that Jesus was talking about upon what he would build his church was Jesus himself. When he makes this statement right here and he says, you are the Christ, the anointed son of the living God. That is the rock. Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the cornerstone. And everything else is air. And everything else has been a delusion of man. So, Lord God, bring these beautiful people back into this revelation that know that this is the rock. And we do that with absolutely no condemnation because the sweetest people in the world are people that may be believing that right now. But in Jesus' name, I know that they love the Lord. So, Lord God, make them the remnant in Jesus' name. I say this to you. You're Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church in the gates of hell. Death itself will not overcome you. Now, how about that? I'll give you the keys, the authority to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind or forbid or declare improper and unlawful has been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose or permit or declare lawful on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, now a great other level of empowerment is coming to Peter and to the other apostles. And by the same token, it's you. We have the key to heaven. His name is Jesus. You understand that? We have the key to loose all of the drama of the world off of us and to loose heaven itself into us. Do you understand that that's how that happens? That's the keys. That's the power. That's the courage right there in Jesus' name. Okay, so Peter's getting all this kind of stuff. In Matthew 17, 25 through 27, we see that the, Jesus has to pay the taxes and uh, Peter doesn't know where to get the money from. Well, Jesus says, well, the only logical thing for you to do when you need this money is to go fishing. Amen. Not too logical. But by the power and the unbelievable supernatural presence of Jesus, he said, fish right over there, boom, the special fish that had just eaten a coin uh, that came out to exactly how much they owed for the taxes, he caught that fish, all right? Yeah. So you see what happened is with Peter right here, he's getting him some momentum, isn't he? All right, then, Jesus, then, then somebody makes him mad in, in chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, and I can see him there. Chapter 18, 21 through 25. Somebody makes him mad or something, he says, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive these people? Okay. <laughs> Jesus says 70, 70 times 7. So here we see, see Peter's roller coaster going right now. I, he, he looked out, he looked, at the, he looked over there at, at the world, and he started sinking. Now he's worried about forgiving people, okay? Then in Matthew 26, 36 through 46, he says, okay, you eight disciples, y'all stay here, but you other three, I want you, Peter, James, and John, I want you to go with me a little bit further, okay? Goes with them a little bit further. Guess what happens? They fall asleep on him. Just shortly thereafter, the, the guards and the Roman centurions come to arrest him, and, and Peter just wakes up from his groggy nap, and, and he gets mad in the flesh. And what's he do, Dustin? Takes out his sword, steals the sword from Malchus, and cuts Malchus' ear off. Here we go. Do you see what I'm talking about? It gets a little bit darker here. Just a few passages later in Matthew 26, beginning in verse 69. He says, Jesus talking to him, he says, man, you're fixing to deny me. No way, I'll never deny you. Well, what happens? Shortly thereafter, the rooster crows. Here's Peter again. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, here's the crucifixion. Jesus on the cross. There's his mom. There's John. There's the ladies. Where's Peter? He's gone. Way down there. Running away. Running away. What do we, what do we find happening to him now? In, in uh, John chapter 20. Okay. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 2, we see that Jesus, uh, Peter 
understands, and all the disciples have gathered up to, back together, and they understand that, 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 that Jesus got buried in that tomb, and the ladies were going out there to, to, to minister to his body and, and all that kind of stuff. And then they hear that, that word that the tomb was empty, that the stone was rolled away. Now Peter gets back fired up again and takes off running along with John. Now it wasn't a real fast runner. John beat him, but he made it to the tomb over there. But you know what he does next? Goes back to fishing. John 21, 6. Then Peter went back to his fishing. Do you see what I'm talking about, y'all? I don't know about you, but this used to be my life too, okay? This double-minded life right here. But then in John chapter 21, verse 7, Jesus is fixing breakfast for his dear brothers, isn't he? And we see that picture out there. I think I'll read that whole thing. John chapter 21, beginning in verse 6. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast the net there, and they were, able to haul it. they were not able to haul it in because of the great catch of fish. And then the disciple John, whom Jesus loved, esteemed, said to Peter, it's the Lord. So Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, and he put on his outer tunic, and he, and, he, and he threw himself into the sea, and he swam ashore. But the other disciples came in a small boat. They were not far from the shore, about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the beach, they saw the charcoal fire set up and fish on it cooking and said, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. And Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net full of large fish, 153 and the net didn't tear. And Jesus said to them, Come, I have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him who you are. They all knew without any doubt that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them. Likewise, the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared just to the disciples after he had risen. Verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, now he's talking to Peter, okay? Lord Jesus, would you talk to us right now? If we're going to take this journey and we're going to get off of the roller coaster with Peter, it's going to happen right now. You see, what broke Peter is right here in these words. From this point on, we never see any indecision in his life. We only see victory in his life. We only see him operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what he says in verse 15. So when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? With total commitment and devotion. And he said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. With deep personal affection, as if for a close friend. And Jesus said, well, feed my lambs. Again, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me with total commitment and devotion? And he said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you with the deepest and closest personal affection for you, as close as a friend can be. And Jesus said, shepherd my sheep, take care of my little lambs. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? With the deep personal affection for me as a closest, closest of friends. And Peter was grieved that he would ask him a third time, do you really love me with the deep personal affection? And he said to him, you know everything, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. At this point in his life, y'all, nothing ever changed. After this, he got it. What's it going to take for us to get it? For us to take our eyes off of the world. For us to take our doubts off of the people around of us. For us to believe wholeheartedly in Christ Jesus. For us not to go back to our fishing, but come right to becoming the fishers of men that God is calling us to be. And the lovers of people all around us that he's calling us to be. What's it going to take for us to move into that place? I believe that the courageous love is in you today. And that you're here to drink deep from this well and to receive him in Jesus' name. And to take his presence into each one of us. And to love courageously. See, love can't come out of us unless it goes into us. Yesterday at the shade tree, I began to talk to the people about why they were having trouble 
being loving. And it's because they never saw the genuine love. Many never saw the genuine love from parents or people that were supposed to love them or siblings or other people in their family. And so because they couldn't receive that, they couldn't give it away. And we have trouble sometimes uh, just taking it straight from Almighty God, but I believe you can do it today in Jesus' name. Beyond your circumstances. When I was uh, about 32 years old, 33 or something like that, 32, I guess, I had a uh, home in, in Dallas in the, in the in Flower Mound area and a big house and acreage. And then beside my house, I had my office. It was a two-story office with a garage underneath and and one day I'd park my car in there and my car overheated and about three o'clock in the morning my whole office and my garage got set on fire so the thing is going up in flames right and uh, some of my guys live pretty close and they're over there helping put the fire out before the fire department gets there and I get a hold of my kids and 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 we we go to kind of to the end of the driveway where I know it's safe and I'm standing there with my kids and they're Hunter is like six, and Ashley's about ten, probably. And they're looking up at me with these eyes of, what are we going to do, Dad? These eyes of fear, these eyes of, I'm lost. And they're crying, and we're losing our house, and, and all this uncertainty and things. And, and they're, they're looking up at me in this way like I, I guess they had never looked at me before as I've been meditating on this this week, and looking for me to give them an answer to bring peace and love and security into their life so that they would know we're going to be okay in Jesus' name. And I, and I did. I just looked down, and I began to hug them, and we cried together, and I held them, and we talked about some things like missionary trips that we'd taken in Mexico and some of the little girls and the boys that didn't even have houses over there. And I just held them for a minute, you know, and then they knew everything was going to be okay. I, 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 I was not a good dad, y'all. But in that moment, I began to realize how we should look at our father, how we should look at our daddy in heaven. We should look at him like Ashley and Hunter looked at me that day with knowing that we can have complete security in almighty God, our father. <laughs> It doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from earth. It comes from our Abba, our Daddy that way in Jesus' name. Because He's courageously loving us. And if we'll receive that courageous love, we'll be able to pour it out on the next generation. Let's all stand together right now in Jesus' name.